On Christmas Day, 1948, a scientist walked into his laboratory outside New York City to check the results of an experiment. What he found that day changed history. It created the global system by which we raise the animals that we turn into meat. And it also paved the way for a profound human health threat that would sweep the world. We are still grappling with the results of that discovery, which was that if you feed tiny doses of antibiotics to meat animals, you can speed up their growth and raise them in conditions that would otherwise be bad for them. And we're dealing with the health threat that flowed from that discovery, the global undermining of the power of antibiotics in an epidemic of drug-resistant infections. This is that scientist. His name was Thomas Jukes. He was a native of England. He emigrated to the United States, and he became an expert in the diets of chickens and went to work for a pharmaceutical company. Now, 1948, when this takes place, is the beginning of the antibiotic era. Antibiotics are very normal to us now, but they weren't always around. In 1948, there were just a few on the market, and Jukes's company made one of the first. You might not know this, but to make an antibiotic is a lot like making beer. You take the organism that makes the thing you want. If you want beer, you take yeast, which produces alcohol. If you want an antibiotic, you take a bacterium that's found in the soil. Either way, you add it to a mass of carbohydrate, you give it some water, you let it ferment, and then you strain off the thing that you wanted. Either way, you're left with a sort of sticky mass of fermented grain and exhausted bacteria, and most companies would throw that away. But Jukes thought that he saw a value in these sticky leftovers. He thought that farmers would be able to use them as a nutritional supplement for livestock. So he set up a fairly classic experiment. He went and bought a bunch of baby chickens. He divided them up into groups, he put one group aside, and to the others he gave whatever supplement he could find on the market. So vitamins, brewer's yeast, cod liver oil, and to one group, those sticky leftovers from his company's manufacturing dried and ground up and added to the chicken's food. When he weighed the chicks, on Christmas Day, doing it himself because he'd given his lab technician the day off for the holiday, he discovered that the chicks that had gotten the antibiotic leftovers weighed more than any other chick in the experiment, twice as much as the birds that hadn't gotten any supplement at all. Jukes called this effect growth promotion. And he realized pretty quickly, though he didn't admit to it at first, that what was causing the extra nutrition was not the fermented grain and not the dead bacterial cells, but tiny doses of his company's antibiotic left behind in the manufacturing waste when the drug was strained out. And with that recognition, he created a new industry. Within just five years, American farmers were giving their livestock 500,000 pounds of antibiotics a year. Now, the total just in the United States, is almost 31 million pounds, and globally more than 260 million. On a global average, probably twice as much antibiotic going into livestock as into people. We've been feeding antibiotics routinely to meat animals for decades now to speed up their growth, to produce them less effectively, less <laughs> expensively. But think about what happens when we make cheap meat, cheap to produce, cheap to buy. To our great-grandparents, meat was something kind of rare and special. They, they ate it a couple of weeks, a couple of months, if they were, times a month if they were less fortunate. To us, meat is something that we can eat at every meal and not just at a meal, but riding in our cars or driving down the street. Cheap meat and cheap antibiotics gave us something that you probably eat all the time, chicken nuggets. But 
Here's the other thing that routine antibiotics and cheap meat gave us. Whenever we use an antibiotic, we run the risk that disease bacteria will adapt to it and learn to defend themselves. That's what antibiotic resistance is. When we give an antibiotic to a sick person, we're balancing that risk against the benefit of curing a disease. But when we give it to an animal that is not sick, there is no benefit. There is only risk. And that's what we've been doing for decades with livestock all around the world. And I find this extraordinary, because just a few years before Jukes, Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, effectively the godfather of all the antibiotics that we use today, predicted a situation like what Jukes would create and told us it would be a mistake. In 1945, Jukes, uh, Fleming and his collaborators were honored with the most important prize in science, the Nobel Prize. And with the prize comes an obligation that you have to give a speech, which will be printed in newspapers and filmed and broadcast around the world. Fleming could have used that speech to say thank you, to praise his collaborators, to boast about his own success. Instead, he used it to deliver a warning that if we use antibiotics in too small amounts, antibiotic resistance would arise and the power of antibiotics would be lost. At the time Fleming spoke, antibiotic-resistant bacteria were already moving through hospitals around the world. Just a few years later, after Jukes' experiment, antibiotic-resistant bacteria began to move through the food supply as well. Suddenly, antibiotic-resistant foodborne illness a thing that had never before existed in the world, began to occur among people hundreds and thousands of miles away from each other, people who had no connection to each other, except for the meat they'd eaten from animals that had been given antibiotics as they'd grown. This is one example of one of those outbreaks. This one occurred just four years ago. This map was drawn up by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and what it shows is 638 Americans in 29 states and a territory made sick by drug-resistant salmonella coming from just one processing plant in California. What you can't see on the map is that the CDC estimates that for every case of foodborne illness that's diagnosed and identified, there are 30 to 40 more. And that means that this single outbreak made maybe 24,000 Americans sick with drug-resistant illness that originated on a farm. The toll of antibiotic resistance worldwide as a result of farming and as a result of medicine as well is profound. Just in the United States, 23,000 people a year die from it, possibly 700,000 people around the world. But if we don't get this under control, the toll of death from antibiotic resistance by the year 2050, which is not very far away, could be 10 million deaths a year. So what are we doing about this? We were late in the United States in catching up to this. England banned all of Jukes's growth promoters by 1971. The Scandinavian countries followed in the 1980s. By 2005, all of Europe had banned those tiny doses of antibiotics. We tried in the United States. In 1977, the Food and Drug Administration tried to ban this antibiotic use, but powerful congressmen backed by agricultural interests forced the FDA to back down. And then they tried again. In January 2017, in the last days of the Obama administration, the FDA proposed another rule that would make Jukes' growth promoters illegal in the United States. And this time, they got it through. So what changed in those 40 years? Society changed. In 1977, this was an unknown issue. 
By 2017, coalitions were arising, first of hospitals and school systems who said to their wholesalers, we will not spend our money for catering for our cafeterias on meat raised with routine antibiotic use. After them came scientists and chefs and animal welfare activists and the families of people who'd had drug-resistant infections and the parents of children who did not survive those infections, all saying that our meat production system had to change. Here's just one example. The chicken company Purdue, which is the fourth largest chicken company in the United States, decided to take a look at what they were hearing from their customers about how their chicken was produced. They discovered they were getting 3,000 communications a month asking them to go antibiotic free. And they did. And they dragged the whole meat industry along behind them, to the point that now McDonald's is working on an antibiotic-free McNugget. So, what are the lessons in this story? There are so many of them. So many mistakes to start with, of trusting in technology, of not asking enough questions of science of taking things for granted, the antibiotics that we thought would always work, and the meat that arrived on our plates without our asking enough questions about what it cost or how it got there. But there are reasons for hope as well, because mistakes can be reversed, because consumers have power, because we realized we are entitled to a voice in how our food is raised. And when enough small voices rise up together, scientists and chefs, animal welfare advocates and farmers, and students like yourselves, they can change the world. Thank you. <laughs>